in the Army now. In my final year in high school, an Army recruiter by the name of Sergeant Israel started calling me in the evenings. She had gotten my telephone number from the school counselor and was trying to fulfill her quota of attempting to convince a teenager like me that the best option at this stage in my life would be to join the U.S. Army. I fit the profile they sought, physically fit, on course to graduate from high school, but academically disinclined to study at university. I had had enough of sitting in desks for hours on end. I wouldn't have walked into a recruitment office by my own volition. I always associated the Army with crawling through mud and sleeping in filthy foxholes. Nevertheless, I figured a visit to the recruitment office to see Sergeant Israel was a low-risk proposition. It wasn't like I would automatically be enlisted if I walked through the door. In the spring, I got into my 1975 Toyota Corona and drove down to the strip mall where the Army had their recruitment office. I sat on the other side of Sergeant Israel's desk as she gave me the pitch. It is like she had read my mind. She assured me that the Army was nothing like what I had seen in Apocalypse Now. The draft army that fought in Vietnam 10 years previously no longer existed. The new U.S. Army was an all-volunteer force where, as their recruitment poster touted, it's a great place to start. She guaranteed that she could write up a three-year contract that would provide me with specialized training and the opportunity to live and work in West Germany. Depending on the job I could qualify for, I would also receive the Montgomery GI Bill, which, when I was honorably discharged, would be a whopping $23,000 paid out over three years. In some ways, my military option looked like taking up the role of being the top pole vaulter. I'd be doing something unusual and not especially desirable for many, but there would be payoffs in doing what others were unwilling to do. Most of my high school friends would be living with their parents, taking college classes, and then pulling in minimum wage working in retail. If I became a soldier, I would have a place to sleep, free food, and I would actually get paid to sleep. Little did I know how little sleep I would get. Sergeant Israel told me that depending on how well I did on the Army standardized test, I could be trained for many office jobs where at the end of the day, I would be free to leave the barracks and explore Germany. While my friends from high school would need to find someone over the age of 21 to buy them alcohol, I would have access to all the German beer I could pour down my gullet. I could also speak some German thanks to half-heartedly studying the language for two and a half years. I would have made it to three years, but my frustrated German teacher gently shepherded me out of her class. Nevertheless, as a below-average German language student, I could still communicate important phrases from the dialogues I had remembered by rote, such as being able to ask if anything is in the refrigerator or if Peter Schneider has a brother. Yeah, it was a start. On a Saturday morning, I went to a military entrance processing station in Seattle. I was put in a classroom with other hopeful civilians for the purpose of taking the Armed Service Vocational Aptitude Battery, the ASVAB. For three hours, I was assessed on reading comprehension, math skills, and general mechanical knowledge. For the Army to take me, I needed a score of 55. I scored 109. What job can I get with that score? I asked Sergeant Israel. Any job you like. I wasn't a fan of prolonged camping trips, so I didn't want to be in a unit that spent months at a time in the forest. There were also many jobs that didn't have a skill set that would transfer over into the civilian world. While being able to hurl a howitzer shell 14 miles to hit a target is impressive, the feat doesn't have much relevancy in a Fortune 500 company. There looked to be some jobs that looked easy, like being a supply clerk or working in the mailroom, but these didn't offer the full bonus for college. The positions that had the GI Bill were the jobs that were difficult for the Army to fill. Sergeant Israel suggested that I train to become a military policeman. It was quite possible that in six short months I could be a pistol-carrying cop in West Germany. I imagined myself in an MP sedan, patrolling Germany on the lookout for AWOL soldiers or breaking up drunken brawls at the NCO club. I also imagined my former high school classmates cramming for their survey level classes. The prospect of being an MP was much more enticing. Being only 17, I needed my parents to co-sign my enlistment contract. They did without objection, probably relieved that they knew their son had somewhere to be after high school other than his boyhood room. 
I spent that summer doing a lot of running, push-ups, and sit-ups. I wanted to be prepared for the most rigorous physical challenge of my life. The day after Thanksgiving and well before sunrise, Sergeant Israel picked me up from the home that I had lived in since kindergarten. She drove us to the military processing center where I had taken the standardized test a few months before. She wished me luck and surrendered me and my paperwork to my new handlers. I sat in a hard plastic chair and read issues of U.S. News and World Report. Reagan and Gorbachev had their first meeting, and it was friendly. It didn't look like the end of the world was going to happen, which was fortunate because I was about to be on the front lines if trouble happened. After reading through several magazines, I wondered if someone had lost my paperwork and in turn lost me. Eventually, an NCO called my name, and then he hurried me and a bunch of other male recruits to the medical area in the unheated basement of the building. A medic put a needle in my arm and took a small vial of blood for HIV testing, and then I was told to sit in the waiting area. I sat shoulder to shoulder with the others on a long bench. Nobody talked much. To some degree, we were all scared. If we voiced our insecurity, it would only increase our anxiety. After all the recruits had their blood taken, an unenthusiastic army sergeant came in and told us all to stand, drop our pants, lean over, and hold our butt cheeks wide open. I thought that this guy probably had one of the worst jobs in the U.S. military. Asshole inspector. Sometimes he may spot a bleeding hemorrhoid, but those were only on his interesting days at work. Usually, he just observed poor hygiene. The basement was chilly, and I was happy to be able to pull my pants back up. I had passed this test and was ordered to a warmer carpeted meeting room where I waited again in a hard plastic chair. A Navy officer entered and called us to our feet. He congratulated us on volunteering to serve our country. He had us raise our right hand to swear allegiance to the United States Constitution and to protect the country from all enemies, foreign and domestic. This was a transformational point where I no longer was a mere civilian. I was a private E-1. I didn't feel any different, but I understood that those with a higher rank, nearly everyone else in the military, could give orders to me. The first mission that I received was to hurry back to the main waiting area of the building where I was to anticipate receiving my travel arrangements. I sat there for a few more hours looking through the magazines that I had already read. It was a taste of what I would be experiencing for the next three years. Lots of hurrying up and lots of waiting. When my travel orders were finalized, I got into a government airport shuttle and was driven to the Seattle-Tacoma airport. I was to fly commercially to Atlanta, Georgia, and then travel overland to Fort McClellan, Alabama for basic training. A snowstorm in Minneapolis slowed down my connecting flight, which resulted in missing the ground transportation that was to take me to Atlanta. The Army travel officer back in Seattle had given an emergency telephone number to call if I ran into any difficulty like this. I called the number. The voice on the other end of the line told me that the receptionist at the Days Inn would be waiting for me. At this point, I thought the Army was pretty awesome. I had a queen-size bed with clean sheets, HBO, and a continental breakfast, all paid by the American taxpayer. My high school buddies, who were working at Fred Meyer's stocking cans of tomatoes on the shelves, didn't get this kind of holiday treatment. This was unbelievable. I was getting paid to do this? Nevertheless, I knew that it would be short-lived. I had to check out in the morning and catch a shuttle van to Alabama. The driver dropped me off at the weekend duty desk. I was welcomed by an enlisted African-American in charge of quarters. I grew up in suburban Seattle, so non-white people were still something of a novelty to me. The only African-American classmate that I had was Joe Brown. Although he didn't know it back then, I'd refer to him as my black friend. The only thing that we had shared was that we were in 10th grade English class together. I sat in the middle of the classroom with all the other students with last names in the middle of the alphabet. And Joe was in the first row along with those with surnames that began with A and B. If someone would have told Joe that Jeff Lohman called him a friend, his reaction probably would have been, who? Joe probably had more friends than he could possibly have known. That was the role of one of the token minorities at Woodway. For decades after high school, white suburban adults would be able to show their high level of wokeness by saying, 
I'm not a racist. I've got black friends. We were still in the long Thanksgiving weekend, which meant that processing wasn't going to begin in earnest for yet another day. In the meantime, the clerk could take me through the first stages of processing at the post. Our first stop was a small room, about the size of a supply closet. It was called the Amnesty Room. I was to go into this small space for a minute and drop all of my contraband into a slot in the wall. If I was found to have drugs, alcohol, or pornography on me after leaving the room, I could be charged and given a harsh military punishment. This was my last chance to come clean. I told my guide, that's all right. I didn't think to bring any drugs with me. I don't need to go in there. Yeah, cool, but you still got to do it. Even though I don't have anything bad? Uh Uh-huh. I went into the room, closed the door, and thought about the kind of people that would go into basic training with drugs or their collection of Hustler magazines. Who would do that? When I exited, the PFC handed me a small plastic baggie with a large pill in it. Now, if you don't want to take this, I understand. What is it? I can't tell you, man. But, you know, it keeps you from having, you know, too strong of urges. I found it strange that right after I was asked to drop my drugs, I was handed one. I swallowed the pill and washed it down with water from a nearby drinking fountain. I hadn't realized that I was just taking part in an old army tradition where recruits are given what they think is potassium nitrate, also known as saltpeter, an anti-aphrodisiac. I doubt that it was potassium nitrate because that substance is toxic. The U.S. government wasn't going to poison me during my first week in the army. I had taken a placebo, which the army had hoped would convince me that I had lost my libido. They wanted their recruits to feel like they were chemically castrated. I was then shown a dorm room where there were other young men killing time until the long Thanksgiving weekend was over. Until then, the only responsibility we had was to nourish ourselves with three meals a day. Again, I was glad that I was getting paid to hang out with strangers and eat. Stay tuned for the next episode where drill sergeants don't seem quite as scary as they do in the movies.